It would not be possible to have students at our lunches without the generous sponsorship of our members. And today, it is immediate past president Wendy Sartori Link of the law firm Ackerman, Link, and Sartori PA, who has generously sponsored both student tables. Thank you, Wendy. And now, as we all know, our state has not been immune to the national debt crisis. Today's speaker has his hands full dealing with unemployment, the housing bubble, and Florida's own financial condition. Florida's chief financial officer, Jeff Atwater, is a fifth generation Floridian, and many of us in this room know him as a former community banker and North Palm Beach resident. Jeff was elected to the House of Representatives in 2000. He followed that by his tenure as a Florida senator, culminating in his role as Florida Senate President from 2008 to 2010. He took over at a time when the state was facing its highest unemployment in our state's history. Nearly a quarter of the homes were in foreclosure and we were facing a $4 billion budget shortfall. In 2010, Jeff was elected to his current position in Tallahassee as Chief Financial Officer. He will provide unique insights into Florida's fiscal future and what the future holds for our state. Please welcome Chief Financial Officer of Florida, Jeff Atwater. Uh, a couple things just for the record, that is my younger sister Enid, <laughs> and to the students of Lynn University, I do have to sign the grant check that comes to the university each year. <laughs> I know I'm among many, many friends today, many, many public servants, uh, many entrepreneurs, the risk takers and the wealth creators. It is good to be with you all. I've been asked to spend a few minutes this morning speaking in general terms on our nation's current economic situation and the impact it may have on our own state and our future prosperity. I'll sh I shall be as clear as I can with the numbers and as honest as I can with the consequences to which they speak. The former might, in fact, just a tad bore you. The latter may, in fact, concern you but I feel I must be honest and therefore I have warned you in advance. Now let me preface the considerations of this exercise. Our most serious reflections should not be about the random facts or numbers that I share, but the net results of the manner in which they operate collectively over time. The process by which we choose to husband our financial resources, our conscious decisions on stewards of the public trust must be assessed as a body of work in total. But most importantly, from what you'll hear today, the value of engaging in this conversation bespeaks to the far larger question. For this analysis, I think you will find, exposes a far more pervasive tension that has shaped the national debate of this country for the past 70 years. A rigorous and intellectually honest evaluation will make us a little uncomfortable but it provides a very clear insight into how we view our obligations to the canons of our political faith or the responsibilities to the future generations. So let me start at the state level. We did suffer and we are suffering along with the rest of the globe these past few years, but Florida remains an economic force. Florida is the fourth largest state in the union. By 2015, we still anticipate we will surpass New York and become the third largest state in the union. Our gross domestic product, that is our productivity for the state, already ranks us third in the country. If Florida's GDP were ranked among the nations, we would rank 16th in the world. Ahead of the Netherlands, exceeding Switzerland, ahead of Turkey, Indonesia, and Saudi Arabia, just behind South Korea and Mexico about half the size of Russia or Canada or India. Yet the recent trends reveal the structural weaknesses that challenge our recovery. The numbers I'm now about to share with you may come as little surprise considering we know that our economic engine of Florida has been so dependent upon construction activity to support population growth, 
second home buying, or our tourism industry. This global recession put the brakes on newcomers to Florida on second home buying and did significantly curb tourism traffic. So to that end, the numbers. Unemployment is the fifth highest in the nation at 10.7 percent. 23 percent of all Florida residential mortgages are either delinquent or in foreclosure. Home prices five years ago averaged trading home of a price, the price of a trading home of a willing seller and buyer. Five years ago, 258,000 in Florida. Last month, 135,000. That would explain why 46 percent of all the residential mortgages in Florida are now underwater. There can be no clearer wake-up call to those of us in Florida. Greater emphasis must be placed on diversifying our economy now in time. Manufacturing, energy, and life sciences. Let us continue to recruit and create from within those industries that will provide valuable jobs for the current and a broader, more stable economic base to endure the future economic cycles. But Florida has done some things very well. Florida has, at the request and the vote of the people, placed in its constitution a requirement to balance its budget. Therefore, notwithstanding the economic stresses we are experiencing, Florida balances its budget. It is the quality of the exercise that has earned Florida a AAA rating with Standard & Poor's. Only 12 states in the country can claim such a rating. In an excerpt from their most recent report in July stated, Florida has what we consider to be generally strong budget management practices. The state has a track record of making difficult decisions when needed. Last week, Barron's identified Florida as a state with one of the best records of financial management, acknowledging specifically the wisdom of careful spending and a balanced budget. There are legislators here today who deserve the credit for this hard work. But I have to pause for a moment because it didn't just happen this year. We have had leaders from our community, Ken Pruitt, Harry Johnston, Jerry Thomas, but one I can see from where I stand today who in 1980 insisted that we put ourselves on this course of fiscal discipline that has served us so well. I know I shouldn't do this and it's against the rules, but will you join me in thanking past president of the Florida Senate and our friend, Phil Lewis. All of these accolades are coming at the very same moment that S&P is downgrading the debt of our country. So try to imagine, amidst all the turmoil, the state hit the hardest, Florida, by the financial meltdown and the housing bubble, is receiving an upgrade from a credit rating agency. Let me turn to the federal level, the debt ceiling debate. The most recent and dramatic byproduct of that debate was, of course, the S&P downgrade. Practically speaking, the downgrade did nothing to change global economic realities. Treasuries remain the investment of choice, and the dollar is still the world's reserve currency. The US GDP is approaching $15 trillion. By itself, it represents 25% of the entire GDP of the globe, twice that of China or Japan. Yet we cannot take solace in those numbers because the underlying numbers are all trending in the wrong direction. The point of all of this, it's not the downgrade that is harming our potential. It is our policies, taxing, spending, regulation, and an insatiable appetite for debt. So let me take them one at a time. Debt, spending, regulation, taxation, the debt. In 1970, the debt for every man, woman, and child was $9,300. Today, $40,000. Our national GDP stands at 93%. Our debt stands at 93% of our national GDP. This year, it will cross over 100. Now, some will argue that that shouldn't concern us. It did peak there before, and that is true. Right after World War II, 
we crossed over 100%. But in 10 years, we had cut it in half. Today, there is no forecast, there is no plan to reduce the debt. Unlike our discipline from World War II, we are buried in debt for the long haul. So Standard & Poor's merely shared the difficult truth. Washington politicians from both parties have either been unable to confront the problem based upon their skill, or they are unwilling to confront the problem out of the risk of their own political futures and ambitions. Now to spending. The entire debt limit crisis is merely recognition that federal spending has been increasing faster than any economic indicator can rationalize, and our spending patterns have changed significantly. Total federal spending as a percentage of our GDP as a nation was 11.5% in 1948. It's now 24% today. Look at it this way. If you took federal spending in 1948 and then every year corrected it for inflation and corrected it for population growth, you would think when you came to today, you would be relatively close to the spending of today. You wouldn't. You'd have to multiply that number by 11. When seeking to understand the spending binge or the spending addiction, it's critical to identify the largest factors. Defense spending was once in the 1950s 72% of our spending. Today, it's 20. Conversely, at the same period of time in the early 50s, payments made to individuals, payments made to individuals from our federal government were 14% of total spending. Today, they're 66% of federal spending. I'm going to come back to that. Regulatory burdens. The cost of regulation. The Office of Management and Budget, the Congress, expresses that regulation has been rapidly increasing in this country since 2005. In 2008, the Small Business Administration, that the cost of all regulation is now annually a cost of $1.7 trillion on the backs of businesses and consumers. Just in 2009, the OMB reviewed the bills that were passed and the rules that were made at the federal level, and they added $13 billion more in cost upon businesses and consumers. And now taxes. This tells a great story. In 1969, 12% of the Americans, 12% of Americans did not pay federal taxes. Today, 44%. The top 50% of income earners pay over 97% of federal taxes. The top 1% contribute 38%. Now, I seriously doubt that any of the icons of our past could ever have imagined in America where 50% of the population benefited from the economic risk and productivity of the other half. Presenting these facts is a series of reference points, so here are some conclusions. Over the past 70 years, the cost of government to families and businesses has been increasing rapidly. Debt at all levels of government is higher than at any time in our history. Deficits continue to grow. We borrow 42 cents of every dollar we spend. The political class in Washington seems powerless to address it. Europe is in a genuine crisis. Our economy struggles. Business uncertainty means weak job creation. And what we know is for all of this that future generations are now yoked to the burdensome financial obligations that we are placing on them. We are rapidly approaching a point where we are paralyzed by debt and there simply is no incentive to create jobs or new opportunities. To those who would suggest that taxing the wealthiest Americans is the response, please note again the earlier statistic. The top 1% pay 40% of all income to the federal government. 44% of us pay nothing at all. Generally, doing the right thing becomes increasingly arduous the longer the wrong course is followed. And that is our challenge today. The layers of bad habits and misguided policy make 
taking the right path more challenging, but no less imperative. The challenge now for us is to find bridges back to prosperity. And to that end, I'd like to offer a couple of suggestions. This is not meant to be the entire universe of ideas, but its focus will be on fiscal discipline and economic growth to address corruption in the budget process in Washington, to accept additional restrictions constitutionally, to relieve cost burdens on businesses and families, to unleash the potential of the American spirit, and getting our spending under control. So first, we should enthusiastically embrace the ethical imperative of open and transparent government. Budgeting in the light of day invites millions of our fellow citizens to participate in the distribution of their hard-earned tax dollars. Secondly, it is clear, regardless of the political party and the majority in Congress, they can't grasp the exercise of fiscal discipline. The Congress must send to the states for ratification a constitutional amendment for a required federal budget, for a bit for a federal budget. The vast majority of states have a constitutional requirement to balance its budget, as do our counties and our cities and our school boards. And if it's good enough for the states who created the federal government, it ought to be good enough for the federal government. Third, we must reform our restrictive regulatory structure that is strangling growth, discouraging invention and innovation, and burdens us with the hidden taxes. Fourth, we must reform our federal tax code. And let us begin with the premise that the purpose of the federal tax code is to bring to Washington the amount of money that is absolutely necessary, but not more, to fund the operations that the Constitution designed for the federal government to provide. It is not for the purpose of redistributing wealth. Lastly, might we have an honest conversation about entitlements without name calling or fear mongering? Social Security was signed into law in 1935 with the set retirement date of 65 years of age. In the 1930s, the average lifespan of a male was 58, a female 61. The good fortune that has come to us with longer and healthier living and the unanticipated baby boom is going to bankrupt Social Security before our children and grandchildren will ever see the benefits of it. So I ask, why can't we have a productive conversation about how to preserve it for them when they are working to keep it afloat for us? To recap, we should be demanding of Washington a grand strategy, but a grand strategy that focuses on economic growth over the next 20 years, not one that gets us to the next election. We should insist on transparency, entitlement reform, certainty of a balanced budget, smart regulatory relief, and a sensible, simple, and fair tax structure that celebrates the innovative and the entrepreneurial capacity of all Americans. In closing, just two more points. That being, some of this might have seemed a bit heavy or down. But given what we witnessed yesterday on television, I am more convinced than ever that we have the shoulders that are broad enough, the spirit that is deep enough, the convictions true enough to overcome any obstacle that presents itself to the American spirit. Secondly, I would say this. I believe we are resilient enough, big enough, and compassionate enough to be sure that our public policy always makes provisions for those who cannot meet their own needs. And it should not be that part of that political process to get there requires rancor or bitterness. We have to meet the needs of those who cannot meet their own. 
let us just do so in a way that is mindful and thoughtful and is dignified and sustainable. And lastly, I'd say this, this is all still just a matter of what path we choose. Do we stay down this path of a more intrusive government at all levels, or do we find our way back, reacquaint ourselves with the founding principles of innovation, creativity, inspired work of the individual in this great spirit that we call America? Thank you very much. Appreciate it.